Today, I'm going to read a very early paper of mine published in 2004 in a book titled Race and Ethnicity in New York City. The editors are um, J. Chris and R. Hutchinson. And the book was published by um, Elsevier in 2004, like I said. So the title is Emergent African Immigrant Philanthropy in New York City. Philanthropy is one of the central ideals in African traditional mores. It is no wonder then that African philanthropy takes many forms within New York City's immigrant community. The key features of African philanthropy include the prominent role of informal institutions, lack of visibility to external observers and non-members of group, and small-scale philanthropic efforts by groups organized along ethnic, kinship, and national lines. Globalization shapes the decision to become an immigrant. And the location um, chosen for settlement, as well as the challenges faced in both home country and country of settlement. Many African immigrant organizations are male dominant in leadership and decision-making with an emphasis on volunteerism and recognition of those with leadership skills. It's just that people think that men have more leadership skills than women, which is funny. Professional associations tend to be national rather than continent wide because the focus of these groups is derived from the historical experience of their members. There's high interest in foreign policy issues and US foreign policy towards Africa is subjected to much discussion, debate, and thought. However, the presence of African immigrants at that time, 2004, is too limited to be felt in policy advocate circle, advocacy circles. I think that is still likely the case. The nature of African philanthropy is affected by other factors as well. Elders are privileged for positions of authority, and there may be underlying attempts to perpetuate structures that favor distinct interests. Old stereotypes die hard. Thus, unity across divisive national and ethnic boundaries is elusive. Gender, class, religion, prestige, and ethnicity are some of the cross-cutting variables that delineate lines of power. These interests are covered over by the attempts to persuade members that decision-making within the group understands and works actively to promote group interests. Dissenters are punished by something that amounts to excommunication from the group. Philanthropic groups and institutions, whether they are African or otherwise, are not immune from relations of power. This does not mean that the groups and institutions in question are not well-meaning or that they do not perform socially meaningful acts. The thing though is, as with many things, the role to hell 
is paved with good intentions. But I digress. And actually that last sentence is not in the chapter. Okay, philanthropy takes many forms among African immigrant communities. It exists in the form of mutual aid for friends, extended family, lineage, and fictive kin. This last category includes, but is not limited to, those from an individual's ethnic group, or even from their country of origin, or from other countries, you know, um, in terms of people who are family, who are friends and have now become accepted as family. Philanthropy is also to be found in the form of kindness and generosity towards strangers. Above all, elements of philanthropy are to be found in the corporatization of community-based efforts to develop the human and material resources among many African ethnic groups. Many studies of the processes of your urbanization in the African continent indicate the ubiquity of formation of hometown association organizations that perform social functions, including philanthropy among newly urbanized Africans. These organizations assist urbanized home folk from the villages and towns of origin from these, from which these urbanized groups originally emerged in various respects. The assistance offered include giving material and moral support in times of significant social celebration and mourning for education, as well as for home construction, construction of infrastructure for the home community and various other community-based development efforts. The efforts of African immigrants in the United States and elsewhere follow closely the patterns described above. The patterns are so ubiquitous as to warrant a claim of their emergence from a philosophical orientation towards philanthrop philanthropy in African society. Some groups of African immigrants have both welfare as well as a socio-political and economic function. All groups that are identified in this study, with the exception of the Yoruba Studies Association, have a presence in Nigerian politics. While it espouses a non-partisan philosophy, the Egbe Omo Yoruba tends to be tended at the time to be associated with the ruling People's Democratic Party. Afeni Ferry tends to be uh, uh, tended to be associated with the Alliance for Democracy, which it does not exist anymore. Um, it was rolled together with other groups into the uh, All Progressive uh, Congress, APC. The, some factions of the Egbe Omo Yoruba are part of a mass-based, anarchist, and actively engaged group that is challenging all major bases of power within the political system particularly in the Western states of Nigeria. Yoruba immigrants in these groups are actively engaged in Nigerian politics with some individuals traveling to Nigeria to participate in party activities, management, or even running for office. If we bear in mind that Nigeria has more than 250 distinctive languages spoken within it, we may begin to grasp some of the complexity that exists in these African immigrant communities. Many assume that all Igbos would probably all belong to a pan Igbo group, but fail to realize that Onicha Igbos, Midwestern Igbos, and those in central Igbo land consider themselves to be quite distinct historically, culturally, and that they even have major differences in dialect. Many philanthropic groups are formed to cater to the well, social welfare needs of 
several immigrant communities. They provide avenues for informal socializing. So there are parties, picnics, dances, and all kinds of get-togethers. And then they also give mutual support in times of need. For example, financial assistance for burial costs, for transporting a body back home for, uh, for burial, for child naming ceremonies, for weddings, graduations, and so on and so forth. They are a source of informal counseling for the youth and may be used to resolve marital conflicts for job and professional advice, as well as for relationships, be they of friendship or dating. And they provide an avenue for leadership of a group that validates the immigrant's gifts, expertise, and skill. The associations may also provide development assistance to individuals and groups in home communities. Such assistance includes the provision of funds for scholarships for indigent students at all educational levels, for infrastructure such as roads, electricity, and telephone access to rural villages, and for public health, including potable water and health centers. This paper focuses on African immigrants in New York City because many groups may be located outside New York City or have membership in New York. It will also include examples of African immigrant philanthropy in other parts of the United States. The information revolution that has been made possible by the development of the World Wide Web has caused the emergence of ties among widely dispersed groups of Africans in news groups, discussion groups, and chat rooms. You can see that this is a very old paper. <laughs> so to begin with, I distinguish be between four categories of immigrants. Immigrants, refugees, migrants, and exiles. So this is part one. Um, next, I will go on to my definition of immigrants. 